Good morning, church. Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I'm grateful once again to have the opportunity to share God's word with you. So I've entitled today's message, When God Opens Your Eyes. On the 24th of February, there was an article in the Straits Times. Some of you might have seen it. And this was a groundbreaking story. Basically, because of technology, because we now have a very powerful telescope, the scientists are able to look further into space, and they have discovered six big galaxies, which are as big as our own galaxy, which is called the Milky Way. Previously, they saw two of them, but because it was very faint, the pictures were very faint, they couldn't make something out of it. But now, because of technology, they saw these six big galaxies. So what's the big deal? One of the greatest discoveries was that these six galaxies exist because they were growing and forming at a speed that is incredible. It defies logic. That's why the, the scientists, of course, those who study the universe, they are called cosmologists, right? And this is what they said in the article at that point. The galaxies are forming at a speed that contradicts our current understanding of the universe. In short, what we know is not quite correct. At another point in the article, it says, this goes against our current cosmological model, which is science's best understanding of how the universe works. In short, it confirms that something is wrong, something is not right, right? Based on the knowledge that we have now. And the most exciting statement is in the last paragraph where it says, this is all the more exciting because it is one more indication that the model is cracking. So brothers and sisters, imagine you are a cosmologist, you have spent your whole life studying the universe, you have done research, you have published papers, you have attended conferences, you have debates, you wrote books, maybe you even taught in the universities about all these theories to students. At the end of the day, you discovered it was all wrong. How would you feel? So if this can happen in our understanding of physical things, can it happen in the understanding of spiritual things? God needs to open our eyes if we truly want to understand spiritual things. Let's go to God in prayer before we continue. Father, we thank you that you are the God of the universe. You created the heavens and the earth. You are God Almighty. And you created us to have fellowship with you. I pray that today you open our eyes, not just our physical eyes, but the eyes of our hearts and minds, and you open our ears to hear what your spirit has to say to us and what your word has to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the gospel text that we read today was in John chapter 9. It's very interesting. So if you have your Bibles or your digital apps for Bibles, put your finger on chapter 9 and also chapter 8. Yeah, in that sense. So it was an interesting story, but before we dive into the details of this miracle that Jesus performed, I want to show you the power of this miracle. In case you read the story and you think that Jesus opening the eyes of this blind man from birth was no big deal. It was a big deal. Okay, this is not a science lesson. Huh? Uh, uh, this is not a science lesson, okay? But from what I, from what I learned uh, from the little bit of research, I just want to highlight to you how we see, right? You are able to see what you're seeing now, the things around you, because the eye receives the light signals, right? So you can see that the eyeball uh, just to the right of the apple. And all these light signals are sent to the brain via a nerve called the optic nerve. Right? And you see the word optic nerve there, the little blue strip there. And it goes to the brain. Which part of the brain? And it's the blue part on the right side that says the visual cortex. So in, in simple terms, the eye receives signals, the signal is sent to the, the visual cortex. The visual cortex processes the light signals and shows you the image that you are seeing. Right? That's how the eye works. So what's the big deal? What is interesting is that about 45 years ago, scientists, some medical researchers and scientists did some research and came to this conclusion. They said that if a person is born blind, 
And if the brain does not receive any visual signals, any light signals for a period of time, then that visual cortex part would be permanently damaged. In short, there's no way this person can see. Okay? And in fact, for that research in 1981, they won a Nobel Prize for it. And so it was understood that for human beings, if a baby is born blind, by the time you are six to eight years old, if you are still blind, your visual cortex will be permanently damaged. There's no hope. That's what it means. That's what the research meant. Okay? But God is great. Yeah? About 20 years ago, they did, because of the advance in technology, they did experiments on teenagers. And there was one case, and subsequently many cases thereafter, where an 18-year-old man in India, after the cataract operation, he was born blind, and after the operation, he received sight. So contrary to what scientists believe, right, that beyond eight years old, you can't see. And actually, they rejected children who were, who were older than eight years old. They said, sorry, there's no hope. Our theory says it's like that. Right? And many children, eight years old and beyond at that time, did not receive treatment. But in this particular incident, they realized that even the 18-year-old man received sight. So what science and medical doctors couldn't figure out even up to 45 years ago, Jesus already demonstrated it. A man born blind by the touch of God can see. Can you see that miracle there? That's the first part. And the second miracle, when a person is born blind and he receives sight in that particular uh, incident that I mentioned, suddenly you receive all the light signals. It takes time for the brain to learn how to interpret those signals. And it can be anything from a few months to even one and a half years. So when the light signals come in, you can't even dif differentiate where the table ends and where the chair starts. You can't even tell which object is nearer, which object is further. But look at the miracle in John chapter 9. After the man went to the pool to wash, it says he went home seeing. That is another miracle. How did he get his sight so fast? How did his brain recover so fast? That's another miracle. And as science would have proven it, when they did the experiment on the 18-year-old guy, they realized that the visual cortex, the composition of the visual cortex for a man born blind and that of people like us who have normal sight are the same. And the connections in different parts of that brain are exactly the same. So there you go, you can see what a miracle it was in John chapter 9. Okay, so with that context, I'd like to delve into the details. Let's dive into the story in John chapter 9 and see what we can learn from there. So to relate the story, Jesus saw this man <coughs> in verses 1 to 5. He saw the man who was born blind. He spit on the ground, made some mud put on his eyes, right? And then he told the man, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. Throughout this story, I'd like you to put yourself in the shoes of the blind man. Imagine you were the blind man. Okay, sitting there blind, somebody suddenly put something in your eyes and tell you, go and wash. Probably you might be thinking, who is this guy? Why must go and wash, right? Yeah, but the man went. Okay, so he went, as the story told us, he went. And he went home seeing so imagine the village. He went there, his friends met him, his neighbors saw him, and they said, who is this guy, right? Now, so I like to freeze the scene there in the village when the man entered the village. So the neighbors saw him, who is this guy? Is it that guy? Some say yes, some say no. And of course, the man confirmed, yes, I'm the person, right? What would you expect to happen in such a situation like that? Shouldn't it, shouldn't, it be, shouldn't it be a time of rejoicing? The, neighbor, the neighbors will be so happy, maybe they will go and inform the parents, maybe bring quickly bring the parents to him or bring him to the parents, and the parents will be so happy that my son was born blind, now he can see, and probably they'll have a party, right? That's what should happen in a norm, normal circumstances. There should be great rejoicing. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, other than, of course, asking him a few questions, who healed you? And you said, Jesus healed me, he did this to me. And that's it. But what's more important would be the rejoicing. But none of that happened. 
So what happened there? His friends dragged him to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, to confirm whether, you know, this guy can really can see and who healed him. So instead of rejoicing, instead of party, he was being, being dragged to the Pharisees for an investigation. And then the Pharisees questioned him, and he told them very, very briefly what happened, but the Pharisees did not believe, right? He did, could not believe that this man was born blind and that he has received his sight. And so the, what, did, what did the Pharisees do? They summoned his parents. So the parents were now dragged to the Pharisees as well. Yeah, because the Pharisees wanted to confirm, is this your son? Was he born blind? Can he now see? And the, the parents said, yes, this is our son. He was born blind. Now he can see. And here is the, the interesting part. The Pharisees asked the parents, how come he can see? <laughs> because the Pharisees couldn't get an answer from the blind man, now they asked the parents. And what did the parents say? The parents say, we know he's our son, we know he was born blind, we know now he can see, but how he can see, I don't know. He is of age, he's old enough, ask him. The parents did not dare to say that Jesus was the person, they did not acknowledge, did not dare acknowledge that Jesus was the Messiah, because at that time, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, had decided that anyone who said that Jesus is the Messiah will be put out of the synagogue. In modern terms, out of the church. No more church membership for you. That was what it meant. That's why the parents did not acknowledge that. So, what should have been a time of rejoicing was the mood was spoiled and damaged by two ugly sins that each one of us has. One is the pride of man. The religious leaders, right? When they ask the man, who healed you? Because Jesus healed the man on Sabbath day. And Sabbath day, according to the, the, the Judaism, they are not supposed to work. So even healing somebody was considered work. So they said, since Jesus healed you on Sabbath day, Jesus has broken the law, and if he has broken the law, he's a sinner. And if he's a sinner, he cannot be God. And if he's not God, he couldn't have healed you. You see the logic there? So to the Pharisees, they thought that they knew God better, they, or they knew better than God that it cannot be that this miracle happened. The pride of life. The pride of their own knowledge. That's one. The other ugly trait of our humankind is the fear of man. The parents. Instead of being happy, instead of acknowledging that, yes, Jesus healed my boy, Jesus healed my son, they said he's of age, ask him. They were fearful of being put out of the synagogue. So church membership was more important to them than recognizing that the Almighty has visited them and a miracle has happened. So they were basically looking for the approval of man rather than the approval of God. Right? So these two, these two things, I'm sure we can identify with it. The pride of life, our own pride, our own fear of man, we want the approval of man rather than the approval of God, will cause our eyes to be shut to the things of God. Why? Because our spiritual eyes are naturally closed to the things of God. And I can imagine three aspects. We are naturally closed to the power and presence of God. So when the, when the Pharisees decided, that, no, this is not God, I think I know better. Yeah? When our eyes are closed, we miss the opportunity to invite God's presence and power into our situation. What did verse 3 say? When the disciples asked Jesus, did this man sin? Did his parents sin? Jesus said, no. This happened so that the works of God may be displayed. So every situation in our life can be an opportunity for God to demonstrate his power and his presence. So if our eyes are shut, we are shut. We are shutting ourselves from this opportunity. Is there a situation in your life where you need to, where you, think, where you think it's impossible for God to solve, nothing is impossible with God. Use it as an opportunity to invite God's presence and power. Let God display his glory in resolving your situation. That's the first one. In the second one, if we choose to refuse to have our eyes open, we choose to have our eyes shut, 
then we miss the opportunity for God to clear our mind and heart of any preconceptions. Preconceptions are ideas and principles or even beliefs that you hold on to that may not be true. We think we know better. We are so proud about it. We even teach it. Maybe you even tell somebody about it. You try to influence others about it. Your own beliefs, your own preconceptions. You have certain ways of thinking how God should work. But God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Who are we to judge God? So with our preconceptions, we not only stumble ourselves, we also stumble other people. Look at the Pharisees in this situation, in verses 24 to 34, right? The parents who dragged to the Pharisees, so the Pharisees asked the parents, we know already how the parents responded. They turned to the blind man again. How did you get healed? The blind man had wisdom. The blind man said, how come you keep asking me? I already told you. Do you want to be Jesus' disciples? And that got them really angry, yeah? Because they were very proud that they were the disciples of Moses, yeah? So, so they said, you are steeped in sin. How dare you lecture us? The Pharisees had no answer. They were going on in a circular argument, right? You heal on, Jesus healed on Sabbath, therefore he broke the law. He broke the law, he's a sinner. If he's a sinner, he cannot be God. If he's not God, he cannot heal. They keep going round and round and they had no answer. So they kept, kept asking the man, how did you get healed? And that's sometimes how God uses the simple folks of the world to confound the wise. Listen to what the, young, the blind man said. This is remarkable. How come you don't know? Uh, if you don't know, who knows? In essence, that's, that's the meaning of his reply. Right? Whether, this, whether this guy is a sinner or not, this person, Jesus, is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I know, God only listens to godly people who does his will. God will not listen to sinners, right? And only a person who comes from God can do this thing to open the eyes of a man born blind. You see the simple logic and wisdom of the blind man? And to cap it off, he said, one thing I know, once I was blind, now I see. And this simple logic got the Pharisees very angry because they had no answer. They were going on in a circular argument. And that's why they said, you were steep in sin. How dare you lecture us? And they insulted him further and threw him out of the synagogue. See how far our preconceptions can carry us, my brothers and sisters. Are we so fixated on certain doctrines, certain principles that may not be so clear yet, but we insist that it should be the way we interpret it? or even some life principles. This is something for us to consider. And the third aspect where we may miss, because when our eyes are shut, we miss the opportunity for God to give us abundant life. And the third aspect is God's plan for our life. Imagine the blind man again. Jesus told him, go and wash, right? As a true blue Singaporean, our attitude is, why must I listen to you? Who are you? Right? I can't even see you in the first place. Who is this guy? But he went. Interestingly, the, the name of the pool is called Siloam, which means sent. So just as the blind man was sent by Jesus to the pool, it also tells us, it also tells us that Jesus was sent by the Father. So Jesus probably saw through the heart of this blind man. He knew that he has the faith to believe that the Father has sent him, sent Jesus. And therefore, if Jesus tells me to go and wash, I will go and wash. Right? So, and then you imagine, what if the blind man did not obey Jesus' instructions? What if he said, I'm blind, oh, still must walk to the pool. Ah. Still must navigate to the pool. Ah. It's quite a challenge, right? Yeah, we can't appreciate it now. We are normal sighted people, but I'm blind and must go there. And at that time, it was, there were many, many people there. So maybe he could be thinking, why can't I just take a cloth and wipe it off? Or maybe he's thinking, anybody, is any water? Can somebody give me something? Or maybe with his own saliva, he could clean it off. I'm just thinking, right? Or maybe he could ask somebody to help him get some water to clean off. If he had done any of these, except to go to the pool of Siloam, he would not have regained his sight. So when God opens our eyes, all we need to do is faith to trust Jesus and obey his instructions. 
When God has revealed something to you in your life, whatever it is, what is God instructing you to do? Is he telling you to do something, to stop doing something, to start, to start doing something? Is he telling you to take an emergency corner and swerve the corner to avoid the danger ahead? Maybe you're heading for destruction, for example. Maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a new job or whatever. Right? Or maybe it's a desire or a craving for something. God is telling you it's danger ahead. Swerve. Turn away. Or is God telling you to switch lanes? Switch lanes. Are you chasing worldliness or are you chasing the word? Are you chasing after gold? Or are you chasing after God? God is asking you to switch lanes. So if we do not have our eyes open, we miss all these three opportunities. The opportunity to see God display His glory by intervening in the situation. Opportunity for God to remove our preconceptions. We prefer to hold on to them. Yeah, and we miss the opportunity. And the opportunity to walk in His plan for us. God has given us the Holy Spirit to guide us. God can open our eyes. So how and why does God open our eyes? I can think of a few reasons. Of course, God can open our eyes, number one, through the story that we read. Jesus can touch us, right? In this case, the physical touch of Jesus. He can open our eyes through the word. That's why the Bible says, the entrance of your word gives light. That's why we read the Bible. The Bible is not just a written word. It's the living word of God. God can open our eyes. Right? I'm sure there are situations where you read the Bible and suddenly that verse or that passage or that idea pops out at you. That's the that's living word of God at work. God can open our eyes. He can open our eyes through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is living in us. He guides us. He's our comforter. The Bible says he, when He comes, He guides us into all truth. The word is all, not some. He can guide, guide us into all truth. And the third way that God can open our eyes could be through dreams and visions. Right? In the Bible, there are many examples of dreams and visions, especially the prophets and so on in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, a typical example would be Ananias. Remember, an Ananias wasn't a prophet. It's just mentioned that he's a disciple, ordinary disciple. Right? God told him, go and look for, for an, a person named Saul, yeah, I've already shown to Saul that there's a person called Ananias coming to touch him and help him restore uh, his sight, help you restore your sight, right? So Ananias went and Saul restored his sight and the rest is history, right? God can reveal himself to us, can open our eyes through dreams and visions. And I know that some of us in the congregation here, we are blessed with that gift. You can see visions, you have dreams. Be careful to interpret that in the light of the scripture. Okay, But it is a means that God can open our eyes. So don't be afraid of dreams and visions. Don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Spend time in the Word. God will open our eyes. And why does He open our eyes? I believe that He opens our eyes to reveal what He has done. What Jesus has done on the cross. He died on the cross so that we can have forgiveness of sins, salvation, healing, deliverance. What He has done 2,000 years ago. It's not a fairy tale. It's a fact. And he wants to reveal to us what he's doing as well. What he's, do what he's doing in our lives and in the lives of people around us. If you go around the congregation and talk to people and fellowship with people, you'll be able to listen to very interesting testimonies of how God touched different lives. God is alive. He's moving. And the third, third area, why why he opens our eyes, is also to show us what he will do. We are living in the end times. We know that we are living in the end times, when Jesus is going to come anytime. We don't know when. But we are equipping the church. We are building up the church. We are encouraging one another. We are to be prepared to meet God face to face. If we are fortunate and Jesus tarries, maybe we might even not see death. Right? We don't know. Yeah? So God wants to open our eyes to reveal what he has done so that we can understand the impact of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. So that we know our identity as God's children. We are forgiven, we are saved, we are healed, we are delivered. And by doing all this, we exalt the name of Jesus, right? God sent Jesus into the world. He says, this is my beloved, my beloved son. 
yeah, to, with whom I'm well pleased. And we know that we are going to exalt the name of Jesus. He's coming again as a, as a king in the second coming to exalt the name of Jesus. And Jesus' name is above every other name. And he has paid a great price for it. He is deserving of that praise and glory and that exaltation. So God does not just want to open our eyes. He wants to give us wholeness in our being, in spirit, in soul and body for what he has done on the cross 2,000 years ago. Okay, the Bible tells us in Isaiah, it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. There's prophecy about Jesus. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, was on him, and by his wounds we, we are healed. And in another scripture, it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for prisoners. That is the reason why Jesus died on the cross to set captives free, to move us from darkness into the kingdom of light. So brothers and sisters, this is good news, right? This is good news for us. Jesus is not done with us yet. He has saved us. But some of us need healing. Some of us need deliverance and, and, and other issues in life. Jesus is not done with us yet because he wants to make us whole. We want Jesus to open our eyes so that we can see what he has done for us, so that we can put our trust fully on him. And this is shown in the, in the story. Towards the end of the story for the blind man, you remember the blind man was thrown out of the synagogue, right? Because the, the religious leaders are fed up with him for uh, making them look not so clever, right? In that sense, yeah? And Jesus found him again. So you see, at first Jesus saw the man, he healed him, and then he went through the whole episode of debating with the religious leaders and he got thrown out. And Jesus found him again. And he sat down with him to talk to him face to face. Listen to that conversation. Jesus asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And this is a critical question for all of us. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man said, who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus knew that his heart was ready and then Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Brothers and sisters, if there's a stirring in your heart, Jesus is the one speaking with you right now. And the man said, Lord, I believe. These are the, probably the three most important words in our Christian life. Lord, I believe. Because if you believe, anything can happen. If you believe, you will pray according to God's will. God will answer your prayers. If you believe, you will seek the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit will guide you and fill you. If you believe, you can do wonders for God. That's what Jesus said. Greater things than these will you do. Lord, I believe. How will we respond? Let's ask Jesus to open our eyes. I'd like to invite the musicians up here to take position and to just gently play the music of the response song. Let's ask Jesus to open our eyes to what? As I mentioned earlier, the three aspects. Ask Jesus to open our eyes to his power and presence. Whatever situations you are facing right now, be it a medical situation, a financial situation, or other situations. Bring it to Jesus. See it as an opportunity for God's presence and power to be displayed. That's the first thing we can do. So perhaps you can just close your eyes for a few seconds and think of that situation that you think is impossible. That person, that place, that event, that happening, that condition. You think that is impossible. Bring it to God right now and say, Dear God, I bring that situation before you right now. That person, that place, that event, that condition. 
I know that this is a chance for you to display your power. Give me faith to hand over that matter to you so that you can display your power and glorify God. God's presence and power is ready and available anytime, at all times, to help us. Bring it to Him. The second aspect that you can bring to God, ask God to open your eyes. Tell God honestly, what are some preconceptions you have? What are some ideas and fixations that you have that is not helping you? It may even be creating problems in your relationships or even in your mind. Bring it before God. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts than our thoughts. Don't hang on to those preconceptions that stumble your own faith and maybe even stumble other people. Do we have any preconceptions that are not right in the sight of God? The third area that you may want to consider, what is God asking you to do? He has a plan for our lives. Is God asking you to stop doing something? Think of that something that you can, you should, you, God is asking you to stop. Or something that you want to start doing today, not three years later. Stop doing today, start doing today. Is God showing you some danger ahead? Maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a job opportunity that you shouldn't even take, for example. He's asking you to make an emergency turn, maybe a U-turn, to swerve, quickly swerve, and turn away from evil and destruction. Is he asking you to switch lanes? Which road are you on? Are you on the road to godliness, or are you on the road to gold and silver? Are you on the road to worldliness, or are you on the road to understanding and digging into the Word of God. The difference between goal and God is the letter L. The difference between world and word is also the letter L. And it's a very bad letter there. It signifies love of the world. If you remove love of the world from your life, you will have God and His Word as a central focus of your life. So I pray that as we meditate on this, ask God to open our eyes. How can His presence and power help us and glorify God in our situation? What kind of preconceptions should we throw away that are not glorifying to Him? And how can we move into His plan for our lives? Hallelujah.